Kastorinska, in return in beyond all time, space, and process. Beyond the dreamfulness in their modifications, the dispel of darkness in the crystal of light, the supreme perceptual and reincarnation of divine grace. May thou lead us from the unreal to the real, and from death unto the eternal everlasting. Some of you know uh, there was a, another sister who had uh, lost a brother and uh, who also was Sakiani's uh, dad. Uh, so uh, if you all would be uh, so kind to indulge uh, me and uh, offering you uh, an opportunity to Extend your condolences to Anasawa and Murabakti, who is here today, and hopefully uh, you'll say a prayer uh, for Saki and the G as well. Mm -hmm. So, I love it.
First of all, I wish all of you mothers in here, both male and female, <laughs> a very happy Mother's Day. Most of the love we have for our children is a direct result of our mothers. some sense even duplicate that uh, mother-like, tender, kind of, for all sentient beings, whether they are related to us or not. So uh, a few songs for Mama. Hmm? Uh, Roger Vera, I think uh, you can start your order. Just wanted us to uh, have an opportunity to uh, really appreciate uh, uh, our mothers, uh, those who are here and those who have gone on. All right.
have to understand how this place here works. Uh, the Lord is formless. The Lord doesn't take a form itself. It takes the form of a mother. And uh, the mother is the uh, highest uh, human expression of divine love in everyone's life, you see. And so whenever mankind becomes too fallen, too corrupt, too loveless, uh, the Lord makes a woman a mother. Thank you. So it makes mothers so precious, you see. So uh, we need uh, mama love in this world. Uh, these are dark times that we're living in. The Hindu mystery is called it the Kali Yuka. So I want you mothers in here to turn it up mm -hmm. and uh, extend some of that love beyond the, the immediacy of your family. There's a whole bunch of kids out here. Who needs uh, your love too? So, <clears throat> just wanted to make sure that the message uh, didn't get missed. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever God uh, sends His love, he's, He gives you a mother. Okay? All right. That's a hidden message for the uh, House of Our Sister. <laughs> I'm sorry about you, Peter. Hmm?
had it, the heart is open, uh, what we can rest would like to discuss. <coughs> yes, beloved. Um. I suppose, beloved, from a purely uh, uh, theological point of view, mm -hmm. uh, there's different kinds of prayer, so that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you find prevalent in most uh, religious churches and mm -hmm. so forth and so on, uh, the kind of prayer that uh, typically characterizes the religious minds is a kind of petitionary prayer. It's a prayer to uh, whatever your concept of God is, uh, to intercede on your behalf, okay. really on the behalf of your ego. First of all, that has to be made clear. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, ego-based, and it's a uh, so petition and intercept, asking that individual's concept of God to intercede on their behalf, you see, uh, and make something in their worldly life line up with their uh, desires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could be, uh, please, Lord, give me a husband. Please, Lord, give me a wife. Please, Lord, let me win the lottery. Please, Lord, take this cancer away from me, or et cetera, et cetera. But it's always a plea to uh, the individual's concept of God to uh, intercede. So it's intercessionary prayer. And that's the typical form of prayer. Uh, it is uh, a plea for, to God to help reinforce your ego sense of self in your worldly life. And then there's another kind of prayer as well. And, uh, uh, it's very much like the first type where there's a plea to God, but this time not for yourself so much, but for your friends, your relatives, your loved ones. You, see. Uh, you pray for them so that uh, the Lord will intercede on their behalf and give them a husband and wife too. <laughs> uh, so forth and so on. It's the kind of prayer that uh, sometimes you will hear people praying. You've been to church before, right? We all pretty much went to church. So you, 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 you recall mm -hmm. the, the uh, language, the content of these prayers. And then there's a, uh, another kind of prayer uh, that is basically a prayer of uh, uh, praise. You know what I mean? the praise of uh, the individual's concept of God for delivering. You see my point? The husband, the wife, the car, etc. Et and then there's a, a different kind of prayer. Uh, when Jesus was asked, how should we pray? You probably recall the story. He said, Our Father, which art in heaven, how will be thy name? Thy will be that's the essence of the prayer. Hmm? Uh, thy will be done. You see. So if you want me to have cancer, then let it be. And if I'm not to have a husband or wife, that's all right. Your will is best for me. You see, there is no petition. There is no request for intercession. Mm -hmm. You see. Uh, Mirabai, our prayer reflects that kind of prayer where she said, uh, Lord, uh, it is my uh, prayer that you would uh, uh, 
destroy heaven right? and hell both so that nobody prays to you to go to the one and avoid the other, you see? Mm -hmm. So there's different kinds of prayer, mm -hmm. you see? And uh, I'm not particularly against it, you see my point? It's a coping mechanism. It helps you to uh, deal with uh, your condition, your situations, and so forth and so on. Uh, some philosophers compare it to a drug, you see, to help uh, relieve you of your fears and your anxiety of your inevitable death and die. So a lot more can be said about it. She was a woman that, uh, that was a beggar of love. Because mm -hmm. uh, my father was a southern brother. Mm -hmm. And he thought um, the only way that he could give love is material. Mm -hmm. So he provided. Mm -hmm. And I remember my mother teaching me something. Mm -hmm. She said, son, she said, never give a woman an item to use as a gift. Don't buy no vacuum cleaners, mm -hmm. pots, pans, <laughs> none of that stuff. <laughs> All right? She said, if you're going to love a woman or love a person, you love them with your heart. And you let them know every day that you care about them. Mm -hmm. And that, that's one lesson which I remember my mother left to me. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes, that become a hard practice to do based on the fact that, you know, I had my own idea of how to be loving. Mm -hmm. But every time it was that I got too far out there, you know, I hear this woman telling me that. Mm -hmm. And of course, sometimes she takes the form of you, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 you know, it, it's just, you know, when, when you talk about you know, motherhood, you talk about the institution. And uh, I thank you for opening up today's uh, sad song with that. Mm -hmm. Remind of how important it is uh, to be loved by a mother. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Yes. You see, our mothers and some fathers, I don't want to diminish the fathers, but uh, uh, the mother is the, uh, the best metaphor. The mother is the first teacher. She's the adiku, your first school. And uh, uh, she teaches you many things. You see. Not so much in the form of lectures, but through her demonstration to us of uh, unconditional <coughs> love. Uh, she is the giver of the experience of being loved. And this experience of being loved is so crucial that you are able to develop the ability to love. You must first be loved. You see? And where that uh, doesn't happen, you see, and you're a therapist, you know very well that many of the issues uh, that are presented in therapy are issues that are the result of the lack of having the experience of being unconditionally, beyond your imperfections, your comments, and faults, and so forth and so on, you see. And she loves you, you see, because you are hers. Okay. Uh, there's that identification. But that kind of love, high as it may be, uh, from a worldly point of view, is not the same as a uh, Divine love. Yes. It is perhaps the highest form of worldly love, but it's still worldly love. You see. 
That's why she whoops you. <laughs> and so forth and so on. Uh, but nevertheless, it is uh, usually uh, our first uh, experience of being loved. And becomes a kind of uh, reference in our future relationships, you see. It's really interesting, as you well know, because uh, very often in the male psychology, there's this search mm -hmm. for the experience of mama's love and your wife, you see, and so forth and so on. It's there, it's sometimes very unconscious, you see. The mother's love in the case of females is a little different. It's a little tougher. But again, ultimately it serves the same function, you see. Uh, gives her the experience of what it feels like to be loved and protected. And of course, we can talk all day and many days about that, you see. But what you find in these examples, beloved, is the fact that uh, our mothers and our fathers love us because we're not the other. And the other is the problem, you see. It's always the other, as long as you look upon people as the other, then you will have fear. So one of the greatest uh, instruction that we can get from our parents uh, is to uh, somehow or another understand uh, that uh, those who are not members of our family are not necessarily <coughs> the other. So they might make you share with your neighbors, you see, and so forth and so on, move you beyond the limitation, you see, or cool song, you see. But uh, certainly when there's the feeling that uh, someone is the other, uh, there's not going to be much love. So, uh, much more can be said. Uh, my personal point of view is that uh, the ultimate function of mother, parents, mother, father, etc., is to teach you to love yourself. But the problem with that, unless uh, your mother is a Buddha. Mm -hmm. The self she going to teach you to love is not even who you are. And in some sense, you see, that sets you up mm -hmm. for a lot of problems. Yes, but Okay. Does that help
he just sent me a text. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to ask you mm -hmm. to pray for him. Mm -hmm. And I think you know for him to do that, that's, I know. I know. that's huge. I know. You, you know that. So, the only thing I can do is deliver the message. Text him back and tell him I, I never stopped praying for him. Okay. From the first time we met, he will understand that. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. As to your remark about that, Giving it to the Lord. I'm giving it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give it to the Lord. <laughs> I'll mess it up. But uh, it's really about developing the attitude of letting go. So let it go. So let it go. And that prayer that we mentioned that Jesus prayed, that will be done, is a kind of example of a prayer of letting go. Let it go. Let it go. But to let go requires that you have a certain kind of understanding. Without understanding, there is no letting go. There is no turning it over to the Lord possible to let it go. They don't have the understanding. Long as you feel that something wrong is happening here, well, the body dies. There's nothing wrong going on here. Hmm? When you think something is wrong, then it becomes very hard to let it be. Because you think it's wrong and you want to fix it. You want God to fix it. You see? Uh, but God designed birth and death. You see? And this has to be understood and understood profoundly. And of course, we do one workshop. We have a part two where we will do that. It's beyond the scope of this. Uh, Context. And so, uh, even when the, we enter into uh, that uh, stage of being in life where the body has to fall apart, you see, you can let that go because you understand nothing wrong with it. Josh is uh, sending out a plea because uh, he's afraid. You see. And he's unprepared. Mm -hmm. And my relationship with him uh, for what, the last 15 years, almost 20, 20. 20 years, yeah. Text him. Did you text him, beloved? Text him now. Yes, beloved. Master, I have a, my mother, she represented the rose. My father represented the ham. God knows I need both. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, my mother, she gave me the love. If I fell on my skin, my knees, she would come here, baby. My father throw some dirt on and do some push-ups. Mm -hmm. you know, so. But that balance, I was so blessed to have. And I see that in a master. I see that in the group, just that balance, mm -hmm. that grows and that hammer. Yeah. And uh, sometimes uh, the, that, that kind of relationship with uh, one's guru uh, mimics each of those dynamics. You see, sometimes it's consoling, sometimes it's blows, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the goal uh, of those dynamics and the, the guru says she our relationship is very different. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, mother and father trying to prepare you for this world. 
you see. And those dynamics that you see uh, informing uh, the parenting processes uh, is uh, strictly purpose for that, whereas the dynamics in the Guru Shishia relationship is preparing you uh, for something altogether different, you see. Uh, and uh, it is not uh, always like a, a mother's role because your mama rescues you from a lot of stuff you're supposed to do for yourself. Uh, and one of the interesting things uh, at Tantra G, we, we, we ha uh, have those kind of uh, concepts that we carry over from our uh, parenting experience uh, in terms of our relationship with our concept of God in group, you see. Uh, some folks' concept of God is like God is your parent in the sky, you see my point? They have a uh, uh, childish concept of God. Parental Godism is what we call it. God is parent. And then you can have that same uh, fundamental uh, concept in, uh, in the uh, Guru Chachia relationship. Guru is father, is parent. But Guru is not your parent. You follow me? Uh, there's not going to be any rescue in you from your own responsibility because that's not possible. You, see. Mm -hmm. you have to understand your life. You see. So the guru role is uh, uh, it's more Socratic, more dialogical. It's, it's, it's more, you see, uh, like a cooler thing. Uh, to get you to look at it, see your condition, and take responsibility for your life, not risk it. It's a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like the father who has all the answers. You know, daddy got all the answers to everything. You see, even if they're wrong answer, he's got them. <laughs> but the guru is not like that either. You see, the answer is in you. You got to go there, are you with me? So forth and so on. So while the 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 two kinds of relationship have some things in common, you see, in some sense they're very different, and that can become problematic because you have to understand the fundamental uh, uh, mentality. The ordinary human being is to uh, give their responsibility for their life over to <coughs> somebody else, you see. Mm -hmm. That's the fundamental impulse. See? Make somebody else responsible for your life. <coughs> you see? And uh, you see that played out in all kinds of religious and spiritual context. You see, you go to church and you make the pastor, you give him all the responsibility, you give it all to Jesus and so forth and so on. You know. And you remain irresponsible. And there are those ready to play that game with you. Are you with me? But it's a game. You see, there is no laying of hands. There is no Shakti Bhakta. You with me? Mm -hmm. You got to understand your life. And the Guru helps you understand some of that process involved in understanding your life, you see. And getting straight, are you with me? And getting responsible, you see. Uh, that's what makes it sometimes full of uh, tapasina. See, because you don't want to be responsible. You don't want to do the meditation. You don't want to do any of that. You want the Guru to hit you with some chakti part. You see my point? And relieve you of that ordeal. That's not going to happen. You see my point? 
that kind of deal is made by Reverend C. T. Chicken Wing. He'll get on you for a fee. Mm -hmm. The Buddha's not going to do that. And um, what is that process? What is the structure of that process? What is the instructions? The injunctives that the Guru gives us. You may find that interesting. Maybe it's for a brief review for those of you who are on the path and have been and so forth. Uh, the first order of business, uh, when you come to the Guru, uh, is uh, the Guru ultimately will redirect your uh, fascination with God. <clears throat> See, cause usually we come through the door and we want the Guru to uh, help us uh, realize God. Are you with me? So that game is played a little bit. You see my point? Mm -hmm. But over time, very slowly, depending on each individual's capacity, that game's in. You see? The Guru becomes more like a Buddha. Buddha simply did not entertain any kind of metaphysical speculations about God and all of this because that's not your problem. <coughs> so the, the order eventually, over time, very slowly, very carefully, gets reversed. And the Guru starts insisting, know thyself. First, understand yourself. You see, Atma Victoria, inquiry into your true self. Find yourself out. You see, because if you don't know yourself, how you gonna know God? Come on, who you kidding? First, know thyself. You see, you have to make that inquiry. <clears throat> then, after that, then the inquiry into this world, all of this has to be. Then, now, finally, you enter into the inquiry into Brahman, into God, and so forth. But if you must have a foundation for that kind of higher level of inquiry. Are you following me? Because if you don't know yourself, uh, you don't even understand yourself. Uh, fundamentally, you're ignorant. So that's always the first thing. You see? The ancient African mystics taught that, the Greek mystics taught that. You see, the Greek mystics even rode across their temple, their gymnasium. Worship the gods if you must, but first know thyself. First order of business. And see, we reverse it. You're trying to know God, and you're trying to know the origin of the universe, and all of this stuff, and you don't know shit about yourself. You have things to ask backward, you see. So the Guru slowly brings us around. You see. You see. Very slowly. Sometimes years. But eventually, the Guru brings you to that point. He begins to uh, offer you some uh, guidance on how to make this inquiry into yourself. You see. And find out who you are. It's very interesting. Sometimes it can be traumatic, you see, because you keep asking about, you know, uh, God, and he keep telling you, uh, go do some meditation, <laughs> you see, my point, and stuff like that, you see, and you, you don't want to hear that stuff, you want answers, you see. Uh, so it's like that. Have you ever thought about it? I mean, it's Which should, just talk about me, mm -hmm. humanity in general, take the fit? 
<laughs> when should I pray? When I think I need something, when things I can't do nothing about, like death and dying? Or just pray at any time? Well, what you should do first is understand, and that'll make a lot of your prayer unnecessary. You need to understand. You see? And then just as I were saying a minute ago, but the first thing you have to understand is the truth about who and what you are. You see? Because you may find out that what you're praying to is yourself. You see? So maybe something should be said a little bit about that. I don't want to leave you hanging uh, because I know that you are sincere. Mm -hmm. uh, we all have a concept of ourselves <coughs> and the image that we have of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that image that we have of ourselves uh, is uh, usually based on our identification with the uh, not self. Mm -hmm. So we have to find out what <coughs> really is the self because in the an ordinary experience, even the experiences we're having right now in this waking this condition, you're having the experience of something that is both real and you also have the experience of something that is unreal right now. You see, that's the dualism here. You see? So there's something that you are experiencing that is absolutely real, and then there's something that you are experiencing that is not real. <coughs> and what has happened is you mix the two. Oh, right. So uh, there is a a, uh, a argument, if you will. You may find it interesting because I know we won't have time to really exhaust it. But uh, there's a a, a a scripture written by Chanka Arkadia. Chanka Arkadia was a uh, mystic philosopher, poet, etc., etc., uh, that lived in India. Brilliant, really, just a genius, you know. And he wrote a, uh, a lot of things, but the particular thing you may find interesting is what he called the Vavika Sundamani. The Vavika Sundamani. The Vavika Sundamani means the crest jewel of discrimination. Uh, and if you get the, the literature, you'll be able to familiarize yourself with it. But fundamentally, in the Vavika Sundamani, what Chankara argues and make a case for is the supremacy of a vika. You must have a vika. Everything spiritual starts with a vika. There is no other place that you can start from a spiritual path. You see, you can't start from Vira, you can't start from Varajya, you can't start from any of those places. You must start with a vika. A vika is a kind of discernment that enable you to distinguish or to unmix the real and the unreal. You see, we have a mixed up here. Are you following me so far? So what you are experiencing right now is uh, yourself, your atma, they call it, to distinguish it from the ego, the false sense of self. You are having the experience of both your real self, the atma, and the unreal self, the unatma. The true self and the ego, you're having both experiences right now. Problem is, they're mixed, and you can't tell the difference right. between the one and the other because you have not done the inquiry. You have no idea. And so what happens now is that you uh, confuse the nature of the unatma, the not-self, which is basically composed of the body, prana, your breath, your emotions and your thoughts. All of that is unatma. Are you with me? All of that is the stuff that your ego is made out of and so forth. You see? Then you have your experience of your real self, the atma. I'm just using these terms to distinguish the two. It's just pretty arbitrary. Okay? Now, what is the part of your dual experience that you are having? That is the experience of your true self. It's interesting. Yes, it is. Well, 
It's not just a door. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's not the experience of having this body. It's not the experience and so forth and so on. You see. Well, we, let me just, uh, uh, for the sake of time, just keep moving in the argument because I know you'll leave here and you'll be up all night uh, figuring this out. And that's, that uh, justifies my uh, sharing this with you. I don't really talk openly about this kind of thing. Uh, uh, nobody's ever asked. <laughs> but in any case, uh, stay with me now. Make some notes for yourself and try to follow this. Because sometimes it's easier to follow it when you visualize the argument. Okay? Okay. Now, that, and you, and you have to look at these sutras, the shastras, the scriptures, because the sutras, the shastras, the suruti, the scripture, all describe the nature of your true self. Is that about right? Yeah. Correct. Now, in scriptures, what do they say is the nature of your true self? Who said that? Right. Sat Chirananda. Sat means uh, you exist. See, you have the experience right now that you exist. True? True. I am this. I exist, and I know that. You see? Now, what makes us so unique is that this thing here also exists, but it don't know that it exists. The lamp don't know that it exists. The bench don't know that it exists. Mukin Jay don't know that she exists. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I can go on and on. <laughs> you see? But we know we exist. We know one thing for sure. I am. You see? I exist, and I'm aware of my existence. Self-aware existence. You're having that experience. Right now, that's called sight. Hmm? Shit, you know things. I'm a knower. Right? I know this thing. This thing is not me. I'm the knower of it. Are you with me? Follow me? I know this body. This body does not know me. The body is not aware of me. I am aware of the body. That which is known cannot be me. I am the knower. Shit. Hmm? I don't get dizzy and fall off the bench. <laughs> this is right now. Hmm? This is dizzy and dumb. Ananda. Ananda is translated many ways, uh, but Ananda really is not happiness per se. Ananda is more like peace, more like contentment. Uh, uh, it's more uh, profound. Uh, it's like bliss. It's like no desire. <laughs> There's no desire for anything because you're perfectly fulfilled. You see? Now, what is interesting to notice, this is the nature according to all scriptures. You know, not just Hindu scriptures or Buddhist scriptures or Muslim scriptures, but all scriptures that speak of the reality of the self pretty much have these same uh, categories of the nature of the true self. It is solid. Shit. Ananda. That's his nature. Now, what is the nature of what you call in yourself? Because you call yourself the body. You see, you add things to the I am. I am a man. I am a woman. I am a black man. I am a white man. I am a poor man. I mean, just think about it. All of the things you add to your per I amness, everything other than this per I amness is your ego. Now just think about that for a minute. Every other aspect of your fundamental sense of self other than this per I amness is ego. <coughs> so profound. 
our statement, you see, it'll hit you, some of you, about 15 years from now. <laughs> oh, shit! <laughs> I think it just did. Yes, beloved. You can stand. So, when we talk about the I am, and scriptures tell us God related to one of the prophets in the Bible as tell him, I am sent you. And so when we are out of alignment with that I am, mm -hmm. that fills it in with that ego, and that ego take us out of alignments and therefore we cannot be in connection right. within that spirit of knowing self right. because we're involved with this ego that takes us outside of our parameter yeah. of knowing yourself or having that connection with self and the divine. Absolutely. Well said, beloved. Well said. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happens. You, you uh, forget yourself. And you become all of that other stuff. You get confused. Uh, so what, what happens is that we, uh, uh, without Vavika, the, opposite, the, uh, the absence of Vavika always produces confusion. Make a note. You don't have Vavika, you are confused. And the signs of that confusion is that you are superimposing the nature of the Atman onto the Anak. And vice versa, right? It's a two-way street. You take the nature of the body. So we looked a little bit about the nature of Atman, right? So let's look and see. What is the nature of all of that stuff that you are calling me? Which is what? The body, the emotions, the thoughts. Okay, what's the nature of all that stuff? Hmm? That's what it produced. What is this nature? It's impermanent. Mm -hmm. it's, it's impermanent, it's right? The nature of, the, of all of that is impermanent. The body is impermanent, right? The body is not sat, right? right. Atman is sat, right? It doesn't. It doesn't not end. You see, the body, mind, emotion—that's all atsat. You see, unreal, and it's impermanent. It's constantly changing. Now notice. You are always aware. You're aware of this experience that we're having now. You're going to be aware of the dream tonight. <coughs> You're going to be aware of the absence of both. You are always aware. That's sight. Your awareness, your knowing nature is not coming and going. You're always knowing. Always knowing. Because that's the nature of your true self, sight. Now, even this strange quality of Nanda, because this is the one that usually we have the most trouble with noticing. But what you are really doing, fundamentally, even as an ego, you're trying to be happy. Now, you know why you're trying to be happy? You're trying to be your true self. It's very different. Your impulse, everything you're doing, you're trying to be happy. You're trying to be fulfilled. You're trying to be yourself through a non-self process. Profoundness. So, Ken Saab, what you're doing, see, you're trying to be that pure self. You're trying to be Saab. You're trying to be Jeff. You're trying to be another. But you're trying to fulfill all of that while really being convinced that you are not that, that you are this unatma, this ego I. And you confuse the two. What we call anyatsa, you see? Superimposition. Superimposition is when you mistake something that it is for something that it is not. You have mistaken this body for being something that it is not. From me. Now when you do that, now you create a whole world of trouble for yourself. It's like when you mistake a rope to be a snake, right? You know, when you in dim light, a rope looks like a snake, right? Hmm? 
And then in that dim light, in the absence of understanding of Avika, that's the dim light, you see what appears to be a snake and you will be afraid. Right? Because it appears to be a snake. And you have fear. But it's an appearance. It's a confusion. You confuse the quality of the Baroque with that of a snake. And in this example, that makes sense in some strange way because the, the, some of the qualities of a snake is as long as we blah, 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 the same. They, they kind of co share in some of the same thing. And you've seen the snake. It's a memory, you know, because you react to everything out of memory. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. You remember seeing a snake, and the snake was slimy and wiggly, and you remember seeing a real rope, and so they had some of the same qualities, and so you confused and mixed the two. So I can understand why you would be afraid of the appearance of a snake on a rope, because the fundamental <coughs> categories of their two natures are so similar, are you with me? But not that of the Atma and the un -Atma. There's no similarity in their natures. True? True. 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 <laughs> so there's no logical basis for the confusion and mix up. Yet, it still exists. Right? So it's, it's irrational. And this is the world of self inquiry. Hmm? Now you can understand all of this that has just been said intellectually, but that becomes just pseudo-reality for you. It's not your experience because you're not done the inquiry. It's pseudo-reality for you. You follow me? It's just intellectual. It's not even real reality for you. Are you with me? And in spite of your intellectually fallen argument, the feeling of being in this body is trumps. Okay, you follow what I'm saying? There's still no Vavika. You see, Vavika is not knowledge of, it is knowing. Are you listening? It is a knowing. You see. And this is where you got to do the work in. Uh, this is Vavika Jhana Yoga. You see. It is for <coughs> Utterly profound. Uh, Dayasa, where the moderator in the room? She's standing back here and you're all lost in conversation. Uh, you saw him? All right. I was hearing um, when you mentioned uh, the Vika and you said it is knowing, and right away I thought I associate that with actual experience. Because mm -hmm. without the experience, how can one know? Mm -hmm. Is that, is, would that be correct? Yes, yes. It we is. can sit here and talk about blue and everybody understands because they know what blue is. Yes. But when I say, what, how, what do you think about the color bri bridge? Mm -hmm. That would be a fucking bridge. Right. You know. So, the call is, or we're, we're being called, the, we're surrounded. You cannot escape the presence of the Creator in your life. It's impossible. We're surrounded by grace. So we're called to do, to meet at least, I guess, halfway, and again, that practice. I don't know, maybe people... But you see, now you saw the reality is that while that is a true statement, that's not your felt experience. Nobody is feeling surrounded by the Creator at all. It's, no. just, it's just a kind of intellectual... Until reality. it is experienced. But it has to be experienced. Exactly. But it can be experienced if you haven't first experienced who you are. That's my point. Okay, then I would say this. You suffer enough, you go through enough pain, and the dross, in theory, would just seem to drop away. And of course, the more you know, let's say intellectually, I think it becomes mm -hmm. <coughs> that. You are nearing death, as she said, doing mm -hmm. a workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, you one get way it. or the other, <laughs> one way or the other, you will know the grace. Well, if, one, you, if you live, if you, if you have the experience of near, actually nearing death and mm -hmm. realizing that, that's mm -hmm. a, another mm -hmm. motivation. I, 
I don't mean to go off. No, I understand what you're saying. But I love, I like to read, I like to study, but I also know that that's not going to give me the experience I need, and I have to, uh, I have to adopt some. Well, the, 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 the operative word is the experience. Yes. Everything else is rhetorical. Everything yeah, else is the belief. That's, that's the belief. That's what so has to be done. Without there. that, we can sit in a room and just talk endlessly. We about do that. That's what we do. Conceptualize. That's what we do. Bouncing concepts around. That's absolutely right. That's what people do. Not just here, all over the world. Everywhere, exactly. That's right. Churches, ashrams, mosques, temples, synagogues, it's just talking. Now, why is that? You see? Because they have not really understood. These kind of unfortunate people are people who are a classic example of the absence of understanding. They have no understanding. Deluded. Well, deluded just follows necessarily. Deluded, confused, misguided, full of sin. What the Christian mystic called it, sin. You're just full of ignorance. Are you with me? Now, just as the body is no more the atma, Right? We see that clearly. Your mind is not the Atma either. Right. But as long as you identify with your mind, you can't control the mind. You can't have any Vedika. You, you identify with your mind, your thinking, your logic, your reasoning. That's no more you than this uh, lamp is you. Then there's no antidote. No, no, there is an antidote. Vavika is the antidote. And the way to get Vavika, that's the antidote. Practice. You have to follow a certain process. It's called sadhana. <laughs> you see? Every mystic has said that. Jesus called it the way. The, the ancient African called it opening the way. And that's really what the Guru does. He opens the way. But there's a way. You see? There's a real process for that. You see? And to the extent of uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Kierkegaard, there's three modes of So we're in Kierkegaard. Right. Mm -hmm. And the one is where you, the middle one is where you join, you belong, and you conform. You try so hard to do right and, and, and I guess be moral, but none of that is equal to understanding. All that is let me, be, let me Let me just be clear with you. None of that is equal to understanding. That's what he says. You know? right. then he goes None of that. Now the question is the way to understanding. There is no profit in any other kind of discussion. You see, either you want understanding or you don't. It's really that simple. If you want understanding, there's a process for that. There's a sadhana for that. You can't think yourself into understanding. That's the problem. So you're trying to Think yourself logically and rationally into understanding. Right. You'll never get any understanding there. So the mind has to just collapse. It has to give up. It has to be exhausted. Yes. It has to try every yes. route. Yes. And before it can yes. even enter into the Absolute. stage, which would be that Absolutely. The person has to have the personal experience of the fallacy of the mind, and they have to get sick and tired of their own mind. Right. And they have to understand, I've been following this mind for millions of lives. And getting shit every day. And getting shit every day. But you'll be amazed people have a capacity for that. Why is that? Because by following the mind, you can have all kinds of forms of sense gratification. And you keep confusing sensual gratification with happiness, so you're quite content. Are you with me? You have no birah. You see? You really don't want to be free yet. You don't even know you're a slave yet. You don't even understand your condition. Cause why? You have not looked. See, the only way to get understanding, beloved, is never through a process of logic and reasoning. Understanding occurs only when you witness. Witnessing is what gives you understanding. Not through logic and reasoning. Witnessing. Witnessing. Paying attention. Witnessing. But you can't do that because you don't know how to concentrate the mind. You don't have to do no meditation. You have not done this, the similar in the budget. You have not trained yourself at a level where you have the subtlety of concentration to bring that kind of attention that witnessing requires. You think. Thinking is not witnessing. Witnessing is watching the thinking. 
you can witness thinking. All those thoughts, all that syllogism running through your mind can be witnessed. There's a gap between Atma and mind. You are not the mind. But when you become identified with the mind, you become trapped in the mind. Just like when you become identified with the body, you become trapped in the body. You take that which is unlimited and you limit it. You follow me? The mind and body must be transcended. You follow me? And that requires profound understanding, you see. That is why all of these great mystics and some philosophers like uh, uh, Kierkegaard and so forth, they talk about the necessity for this thing. You must have a vika. Everything starts with a vika. Understanding. And understanding happens only through witnessing. And witnessing requires the ability to concentrate. I find it uh, <coughs> uh, not a coincidence that those who most accurately argue for that process that everyone down to the last person is a mystic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone down to the last person. Now so that the mm -hmm. one has to no longer trust what they think. And you gotta start trusting something beyond what you think. But you will only go on trusting your what you think because you don't understand the, that you're not the mind. Mm -hmm. You're not this thinker. You're aware of the thinker. You're the knower of the thinker. You are there even when there's no thinking. Just go to Susupti tonight. There is no thinking, and yet you exist. Is now, it? what is it that knows you exist when there is no thinking? That's what I see. Yeah. That's all. Is there? Um, I'm gonna make you start a cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna is get it, some of my hunting out. Is it like a polar <laughs> continuum? Let's say with the example of the It's not like anything you can think of. <laughs> Let me just put it like that. Can I finish? Mm -hmm. Let's say uh, there's a closed jar, the analogy of the jar with the top on it and everything inside is dark. And you begin poking holes, and as it becomes more porous, light is allowed to enter that space. If that analogy, to the extent that's correct, then there would be progressing uh, 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 developmental uh, process of the vehicle. It's like a light switch. Are you saying you just you turn it off and on? <laughs> Satori. You don't get it. Zingo. Mm -hmm. It's nothing like what you think. How, how, how would you think that was the other thing? Yeah. How can you think about a reality that is beyond the reality that thinking is capable of creating? See, thinking can only create, thinking can only create a dream. Mm -hmm. That's all thinking can do. That's all the mind can do, is create a substitute for reality. That's all the mind can do. Watch it. That's all your mind and everybody else's mind is doing. It is creating substitutes for reality. Yeah. That's all your mind is doing. That's all your mind can do. You have to understand this thing. Watch it. Well, students of the, the Dharma thought, am I too long? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not too long, buddy. Uh, well, but, you know, uh, students of the Dharma, your followers, uh, you know, when you say do sadhana, we go out into the world and we uh, deliver to the best of our understanding, and that is the process of anyone who is part of a, a, a spiritual day. path. Of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So then the person is still fundamentally an ego, but a servant as a translator. Something must be moving in them because if they function as their ego identity in every situation, then it's still blindly blind. It's you still, feel that you it's still a, not a nor. Right. But a translator to the best of the ability based on the training that was received. Is that, that's, if that's not legitimate? It's philosophizing. Okay. Now, final question. Final yeah. question. Yes. 
Yes. We have the workshop coming up. Yes. There has been many discussion amongst the funeral director element. Mm -hmm. You know, they thought I was going to really learn how to be, a, you know, a super funeral director and get rich or whatever. <laughs> you know, everything is going to be okay. Yeah. Now you're telling me that uh, now this is about me finding out how screwed up I am, <laughs> and and on top of that, you're talking. That's not how God works. You know, this is how they have their own concept of God. So we had someone says, I'll never come back to this team again. And to be most effective, it seems to me that it has to be translated to a culture that is, that is beyond this, this gathering, who've been with you for a long time. You're going to be before people who've never heard this before. Uh, you know, beloved, half the people in here were those people that never been in this kind of country. Right. So it's so it's, it's not it's not none of that. It's none of that. Let me just uh, uh, save us both a lot of time here because uh, I don't like to shortchange my interaction with you because I know that you really take this very seriously and you're a very deep thinker. And rather than to tie them up. We, we can go to lunch. But, yeah. Would that be better, beloved? Sure, that, that way we I'm free in our... Time. Yes. And, but your inquiry is good. It's just that you have to understand, you see. You have to understand, you see, what's going on here, you see. But when you understand yourself, then you will understand some sorrow. You'll yeah. understand what's going on here. But if you don't understand yourself, you're not going to even understand what's going on here, you see. All these other people, all these people are just in this world going through destiny. Nobody's here to conform to our ideologies. This is all illusion. This is all lack of understanding. You follow me? You can't bring nobody to the path. You can't bring, how would you bring somebody to the tomb? It don't work like that. You see, you're not the karta. You're not the door here. Are you with me? The mind thinks it's the doer. The mind is not the doer. The, all the mind does is create dreams, substitutes. Haven't you read a thousand times where the mystic said the mind is made out of the same stuff as dreams? They say that over and over, but you're not inquired to see why that is so. Is that so? Is that true or is that false? Inquire, understand, witness, watch and see. So you dream about what this thing should be, what people should be doing. It's a dream. You see? It's not absolute reality. It's a substitute for reality. Just take the one statement and say it with it, because I know you're capable of it. You see my point? Don't feed them somebody for two days. Lock them in, lock them in that cave downstairs. And I, what I want you to do, beloved, is just sit uh, like the thinker. Get that thinker asana posture and think. And try to observe your mind. You see? Because you can't observe nobody else's mind. Observe your own mind. And observe it and see, witness. Just look at it and see that all that your mind ever is doing is creating a substitute for reality. It's all it ever does. You see? Because it's not the Lord. The Atma is the Lord of all that is going on in the mind. The mind is no more the self than the body. The mind is no more the self than your car. You are the knower. You are the drasta. And everything else is the known, including your mind. It's a very, very uh, profound. And I know that the way I work with you, we have to work over teeth. That's how me and you work the best. I know that. You see? Alone. Uh, uh, because I don't want to shortchange you at all. You know, I'm not serving you because my answers are, are too brief. I, I, we need to hold hands and walk step by step because I know the process of logic. You follow what I'm saying? I was trained in Aristotelian logic. I know how logic works, you see? And I can hold your hand and we can execute the logic. If you can follow that, you'll see the, the end of it. Like Socrates, he understood there's a realm of wisdom that is denied to logician. True. But unless you're a very good logician, you'll never know that. You follow me? 
your mind has not been trained to really do high power logical things. And that's not an insult to you. Probably. No, I, I just know I'm going to die. You are never going to die. The ego will die. Right. But you're not the ego. But I will go through that process of progressive. You will be. You will watch that it. process. I will struggle to make sense. Oh, you'll be scared. Yeah, of course. Of course. You will have the same experience as the person that has confused the rope with a snake, and when you see it, you will be terrified. Right. Yeah. Now about that, you're right. You will be terrified when you see what you appears to be a snake. It's an appearance. There's no snake. It's an appearance. Until the light comes and you look in the corner. If the light, there it is. yeah, the, 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 the light, light that's all it. The, time. the light is what we got. Yeah. If somebody shed a light, fear of snake is gone. Because it was only appearing in the absence of light. Snakes, ropes that look like snake only appear in twilight. Mm -hmm. Not in the full light of day, but God is full light. And it's gone. If you go on with it, but I'm yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you all for coming uh, up with me. Thank you. You're my hand. He tried. He was diligent. But uh, we have a date. I owe you a date, so don't forget it. Okay? okay. For sure. Uh, um, Next. <laughs> actually, just one thing that I also have to say, one thing that really caught my attention that um, in your response, you know, so I just I had a birthday and turned another year, and this thing about suffering and how it can lead to understanding and just suffer long enough, and a lot of that literature, you, you talk, you've talked about it in the literature, but what I can say about that, my own personal experience, realizing that most of my life, all, all of my life, has been lived on the side of lack of understanding, and trying to incorporate understanding is that if suffering, my personal life experience, as well as what I see, if suffering itself, long enough, and going through the vicissitudes, in itself could do, could do the work and heal and so on, there'd be no such thing as suicide, there'd be no such thing as insanity, and so on and so forth. So, because I know at one time, you know, I have that whole idea of suffering in itself, just suffer long enough, mm -hmm. or whatever. That's, that without the understanding, yeah. suffering doesn't do yeah. anything. No. Because you still can't, you have, you have nothing to do with anything about it. Mm -hmm. So that was the case. And that's something I have, have realized, that even suffering itself, and, and then what I see as well. Yeah. And that's all I want to say. Absolutely, you see. And in that sense, you see, you are perfectly uh, compatible with the Buddha's insight who was a master therapist, you follow me? And Buddha, all saints, all mystics, all real lives are all seers. That's why they call them seers, because this is something you see through witnessing. Witnesses is a kind of seeing. You become a seer, not a thinker, a seer. This in my own life. You see, my own and you see that. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, suffering, Buddha says, can be brought to an end, right? Because he said the reality, the fundamental experience that most people of us are having is just this suffering. You see? Saram dukam. Just always suffer. Always on the verge of falling into sorrow. All just on the verge of falling into depression and disappointment. Just on the verge. You see. This is the fundamental human condition. You see? And what the Buddha says, see how it is. And it has a cause. It has a karana, it has a cause, you see. The Buddha pointed that out. The cause, of course, we talked already about it, the mind, et cetera, et cetera, right? It has a cause. And uh, it can be brought to an end. And the fourth noble took, here's the process. Here's the sadhana. You see, right? Right view. Always start with right view. Is that right? It don't start with right meditation. It don't start with right action. Right view. Right? And then that right view unfolds into the rest, right? Right intention, right? Right action, right speech, right mindfulness, etc. All of those are the flowering 
And you see in Vedanta, right? Same process. Vaivika, right? Then you get what? Varajya. Then you get Uparati, or the Katsamatis. You see? Right? Then you get Mumchava. Everything starts with understanding. Vaivika. And Vamika is only acquired through witnessing. And witnessing can only be done to the degree you have control over your attention. Hence, the justification for meditation. You develop the ability to concentrate attention. Because this is difficult to see. That's why the Buddha was hesitant to even teach the Dharma. Say, uh, this is Gabira. This is deep. This is profound. Difficult to understand. You almost have to be enlightened, he said, to even understand what he was about to teach. You follow him? So why teach? Why vex myself, he said. Hmm? Subtle. Subtle. See, you can't even wash your breath. Buddha told him, said, oh, go wash your breath first. Learn how to wash something. You don't know how to watch. You really don't. You know only how to become identified with whatever is arising within the field of your perceptions. You don't know how to wash it. You don't know how to wash anything. You don't know how to wash your body. You don't even know how to wash the body. It's, just, it's amazing. Such is the need for guru. Hmm? Such is the need for guru. So you just got to do something simple like yeah. that. Yeah, just to watch the body. You don't watch. Why? Because you're always in your mind creating substitutes for the reality that is right or right now. You are never here now. Wherever you at, you just can't wait to get somewhere else. You'll never <laughs> be right here, right now. Either you're in the past or you're thinking about where you're going to be next. You're never here. You are in your mind. Always in your mind. And you identify with the mind. As long as you remain identified with the mind, how can you watch it? You, you, you're fused with it. There's no space. There's no gap. You see? How could there be? There's no understanding. You see? We're not talking about how the body is spirit system. No. We're, we're, we're speaking more so that ripping, as the Bible was saying, there's the flesh against mm. the spirit. We're talking mm -hmm. about the spirit being able to look back at the flesh right. and identify what the flesh is or trying to articulate without the knowledge of what the spirit has already had. So it's this, looking down at this, yes. and being able to see it in motion. Yes, yes. And see it and know that that's not me. That's not the self. You have to, in Christian terminology, that's exactly what we talk about. Spirit and flesh. Spirit and flesh. That's consciousness body. You know, same language, same metaphor, right? And try to understand you're not flesh. You see? And if you live on the basis of the presumption that you are the flesh, you will perish. So it's the same fundamental argument. You follow me? If you live as if you are a body, you don't have a lot of problems. That's what your problems are. You see? Because you're confined. That body is yeah. an first, Yeah, body. first the body is confined so you don't feel free. Right? Consciousness is formless, free, all over the place. Infinite. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You follow me? Beyond all time, space, and causality. You see? Beyond the three gunas and their, their modifications. That's the nature of our. But when you believe you are the body, you become the body. You see, there's a man, there's a woman, believe it, so they become out of pure confusion, agyatsa. You see, adhyarupa. You see, the superposition of the nature of atman onto the anatma, and vice versa. The superposition of the flesh onto the spirit. The superimposition of the quality, the nature of the anatma onto the atom. 
You follow me? This is a two-way street, and that gets very hairy. So with the, what I recommended to the brother, this may be Kachun Namani, you know, it's a particular text that goes into tremendous depth and detail about all of that, you know. Uh, so I, I, I defer you to that. But you give him a point now? Hmm? You, see. you have to know thyself. This, this is a prerequisite. Nothing spiritual can begin without self-knowledge, and there is no substitution for self-knowledge. And if you don't have that ability to witness this whole think argument that I've been presenting here, and come away with some understanding of self and contradistinction to the not-self, you're not going to understand this world. Yeah, how are you going to understand all this phenomena here? You're not going to understand people. You're not going to understand the world. You're not going to understand none of this shit that you are actually saying. None of this, I'm sorry. How would you understand it? Whatever you understand is bound to be wrong. <laughs> bound to be. And that's been your experience. Is it? I mean, if you just get right down to it, right? Yes. Exactly been your experience. And keep it turning out other than the way you expected it. Why do you think that is the case? Because you didn't understand. You don't understand. And you don't understand because you won't do the work. You follow me? You're stuck in philosophizing. You're stuck in thinking, 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 thinking. Thinking is not the means for understanding shit. It's just thinking. You're not even doing it. It ain't even wrong for you to say, I'm thinking. You're being thought. You follow me? You have to see this thing. You got to see this thing. Getting to know oneself is not getting to know oneself in that body. Getting to know oneself is getting to know one's spirit. Well, it's like this, beloved. You can't know the self like you know this body. You can't know the self like you know this item here. You can't know the self like you would know this map or a tree. Because the self is not an object to itself. That's the first problem, you see? The way you get to know thyself, I don't even think the word know thyself is correct. The more appropriate for, uh, and accurate description is to be yourself. The only way that you can be Atma, because you can't know it, you can be it. And the only way to be it, you see, without any confusion, is you have to know what you are not. The process, beloved, is called nete, 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 nete. It is about removing all of your false presumption about who and what you are, piece by piece. But you will not know the self like the self is some kind of object. In the same way, you're not going to know God either because God is not enough. You see my point? You're trying to know God. That's not even possible. You can be God like you can be self. And the mystics say, once you be yourself, you will be God. There's no distinction. That can be the cause for being beheaded. So. But you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So you can be the self. And beloved, that's all you're trying to do. You're trying to be the self by being an ego. But you can't be yourself by being an ego. Are you with me? So you're trying to be Ananda. But you're trying to be a nun by being an ego. It can't work. You're trying to be immortal, sat, while being a body which is mortal. It ain't going to work. Are you with me? You're trying to uh, be chit all knowing, while being a mind. That ain't going to work. You can't become omniscient and knowing through a mental, intellectual process. Through thinking, it cannot happen. It's not even consistent with the nature of thinking. Are you with me? So 
all of us, yeah, we're just trying to be Akman. You're just trying to be yourself. But you're amateurs at it. And you're going about it the wrong way. You're trying to be yourself by being an ego. How would you do that? When the ego, by definition, is not yourself. How would you be yourself while trying to not be yourself? See the confusion? Just a ball of confusion. And it doesn't work. It has not worked. Are you with me? You're trying to be Ananda, be blissful, while being committed to sense gratification, committed to pleasure. You're committed to seeking pleasure. And you will never be happy by seeking pleasure. Can't happen. <coughs> Sense gratification to the point of pleasure, you will never be happy. That's an ego activity. Can't happen. You and then see, so you confused even about the distinction between happiness with a capital A, you see, and pleasure. You think the two are the same. They're not the same. They're not even close to the same. The nature of pleasure is that, you know, it comes and goes, it's triggered by an object, the senses meet an object, and it produces the, your raga or the vessels, you see. Your ragas and the vessels are the basis of a lot of our dualistic experiences. It's just your ragas and the vessels, you see. What you like, you call pleasure. What you dislike, you call pain. That's all. It's just raga and the vessel. It's in your mind. Ragas and the vessels in your mind, you see. It's in your mind. So that's not the way. You're trying to be happy by fulfilling your likes and avoiding your dislike. You'll never be happy going like that. You see my point? It can't happen by definition. Hmm? But you're confused. You, you're confused. You actually think happiness is the result of you fulfilling all of your likes and avoiding all of your dislikes. And you, that's, your mind has made you think like that. You're not going to be happy by simply pursuing your rockers and, and the vessels. Can I? Confused. Okay. This world, we call it samsara, right? It's like a huge mirage. Right? And I like to remind uh, those who we went to Egypt, you all know firsthand, you can really appreciate the, the metaphor that these mystics use about uh, how an oasis appears in the desert car. We actually saw that, right? We took pictures of it. Beautiful, right? Nobody wanted to get off the bus and go out there and take a dip. <laughs> <laughs> because there was understanding, third eye, eye of Heru, Tisratil. This is Vibika. That is the symbol of the person that possessed Vibika. Now, of course, it's just a ritual in India, of course, right? Go to India, you see every tongue, Dick and Mary got a, a kukum. You know what I mean? A red dot here. They with no Vibika at all. You follow me? But originally it was a way of identifying those who had Vibika. Because the knowledge that that's not a real pool of water out there is not given by your physical sight. Because what your eyes see is actually what appears to be water. You can rub them all you want, and they will still see water. Third eye see no water, it's a mere appearance, and it does not chase it. The whole entire field of your experience that you are having through your five senses of perception is made out of the same stuff as a mirage. This is the truth. Does that mean you can't enjoy it? No. We enjoyed that. We took pictures. We told them to stop the bus. We got so we could get a good look. You can enjoy it. In fact, you can only enjoy it when you understand it. You don't understand. You're not going to enjoy this experience at all, and you're not enjoying it because you don't understand. You're chasing that which does not exist, and why? 
ajana, avidya, ignorance, sin. The Christian makes us say, right, and we're full of sin, born and born ignorant. Sin just means ignorance. You see? Full of ignorance. And ignorance of what? Self, first. Know thyself. You see, then you'll be in a much better position to know what's going on here. And then knowing those two, you will know all that you need to know about God and so forth and so forth. But that's the order. Uh, who will have the last word? Yes, brother. So, kind of circling back to the very beginning of our discussion, you had uh, you mentioned the concept of of letting go. Um, and I thought about that as being a very close cousin to detachment. Um, and tying that to the concept of, being, of dying to thyself. You know, dying before dying, you know, mm -hmm. and, and letting go of your ego and becoming more in alignment with who you are, and you know, the I am. Yes. As the gentleman over here had brother mentioned, that there's a disalignment and a disillusionment of, of that, and yeah. it's that letting go and the practice of detachment that helps you bridge that gap. Yeah. yeah. You see, you can't let go. You have to understand and then it falls away. See, there's a distinction. Because really what you're doing, you're trying to let go of a snake on a rope. Are you with me? So uh, the uh, understanding has to be there. And then it falls away. You can't let go. Like we said, let go of my ego. You're not going to, you can't let go of no ego. And like I said, let me kill the snake that is really not there. It's not there. You can't go kill the snake. You can't shoot him. Cause it's an appearance. It's not there. Understand, and then the snake disappears. Are you with me? So you have to have a right understanding about this whole business of letting go. The more you try to let go of the ego, the, the, the stronger the ego gets. Are you with me? You're trying to let go without understanding. You, don't, you haven't understood. The vegan comes first. Then letting go is automatic. You see? Uh, this virage is, is not purpose to make your life more miserable, but to make it, you happier. <clears throat> you follow me? When, when Pavika produces virajya, detachment, your, the life becomes a lot better now. Because the virajya, you see, the attachments, you see, that virajya disappears, right? We're all associated with the not self. Are you with me? You, you let go of all of that. Right? You see, you stop uh, wanting things to be other than the way things are. You stop operating out of all these false presumptions that your mind has convinced you is the case. You know? You stop trying to cling and hold on to that which you can't hold on to, and so forth and so on. You have life, and as Jesus said, and you have it more abundantly. Because you're free. You're freer. Detachment is a, is a, a, a higher state of freedom. You see, it's like most kind of liberation, you see. You see, it's, it's like an unto waking up out of a nightmare. That's the best example I can think of. Have you ever had a nightmare? Yeah. And when you wake up from that nightmare, you know how that feels? That's what garage is. It's not what people think. People think, oh, I'm going to give up all of this. And, oh, Lord, Lord, what am I going to do? It's <laughs> nothing like that. It's like waking up from a nightmare, literally. You see? That's why the Buddha uh, was, uh, referred to himself as the awakened one. You know, they want to know, who, who are you? You see, what are you? Because you can see that thing about the Buddha. You see? Some were so confused they couldn't even tell, are you a man, are you a woman, are you a king? Or what, what are you? Buddha simply replied, I am awake. Because it's, it is literally like waking up from a nightmare. Now who would prefer to stay sleeping having a nightmare? You see? Except y'all. <laughs> <laughs> the only people I know. 
right? They prefer nightmares to waking out of nightmares, you see. And your life has been a nightmare. And none of the shit worked out the way you thought it would work. Right? <clears throat> no fulfillment, you see. Trying to be yourself in a, a, in a not self disposition, and that ain't working. You can't be yourself, so you feel unfulfilled. You see, avoid something is missing. Yeah, you're missing. You're, you're not yourself. You're not your true self. So how can you be fulfilled? And you can't be fulfilled. And you're just suffering, suffering, suffering. <laughs> so, uh, my G, that's a good point to end on. Don't you think? Hmm? All right. Enough for today. Let me get
For all.